Hi, welcome to Dotto's Data Cafe. In today's show, we have a digital imaging potpourri. We're going to have a really good examination of digital cameras, and we are going to get down to details on flatbed scanners. So stick around. We're going to paint a nice digital picture just for you. <laughs> Aren't these nice? Mmm, digital cameras. I love them. And with all the excitement surrounding these very sexy cameras, we sometimes leave out the workhorse of the digital imaging world, the scanner. Now, we've said it before, but it is worth repeating. Digital imaging is a communications tool now, where a picture can tell a better story than use it. Now, a lot of us still haven't broken down and added a scanner to our systems. So today, I'm going to walk through using a scanner in day-to-day -day communications. Then you can decide if it makes sense for you. First up is our tool chest. Our scanner du jour is the HP ScanJet 3400C. Now, this is a nice mid-range scanner. This isn't the best scanner that HP makes. It's not their top-of-the-line Cadillac version. This is the workhorse. This is one that you can go to the store, you look at the prices, you go, that one makes a lot of sense to me. Will it do the job, though? Well, I think it might. Let's take a look at how it works. First of all, the back side, the connection points. It is a very simple. We have a power cable. We have a USB port for scanning into our USB, uh, for uh, using the scanner on the USB port. Then we also have for legacy systems, for older computers, we still have the old parallel port for connecting it to the computer and then passing through a printer if you happen to have an older system. Now, when it comes down to the specifications, this scans at 600 DPI. That's the 600 dots per inch. That's the optical resolution. Now, when you look for a scanner, make sure you understand the difference between the optical resolution, that's how many physical s dots per inch it scans in, and the interpolated resolution, which is that we use software to sometimes increase the number of dots per inch, but you want to know the optical because that's the actual quality you're getting. Secondly, this is a 36-bit scanner. The bit depth refers to how much color is in each and every one of those pixels. Now, if you want to know about uh, how bit depth works, set your monitor back to 8-bit color, which gives you 256 colors. You'll see that the color is pretty awful at 8-bit. We used to call 24-bit true color. That gave us millions of colors, and it looked fantastic. So I guess if 24-bit is true color, 36-bit must be truer color. At the top-end scanners, you can get 42 and 46-bit, which must be truest color of all. Uh, oh, finally, this has dual-platform support. It works on both Macintosh Windows, taking advantage of its USB capabilities. Now, to s with all of these specifications, the scanner is going to do a good job of meeting all of our scanning needs. But all that power is useless if I don't have an easy way to access it. Now, with any peripheral at all, my biggest bone of contention is how easy is it to use? How easy is it to set up? How easy is it in day-to-day -day use? If it's a mystery or inconsistent, if sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, then I'm not interested in using it. It has to be accessible when I want to scan in a picture. So let's do that. Let's take a nice photo. We've got a great photograph here from our very first season. This is our 10th season of Dotto's Data Cafe. And this is uh, from our first season. Now, this fellow Les Baby here, he is actually celebrating his 50th birthday coming up soon. So we're going to send out invitations to everybody so that they can all come to his party. We actually have to bribe them with a lot of things other than just his birthday. Put it on the bed of the scanner. Close it. Now, look here. There's some buttons in the front of the scanner. Now, these buttons allow us one-touch access to a lot of the scanning systems. And I just hit the one on the far left, which is the scan button, and something magic happens. I haven't even touched my computer, but if you look on my computer screen, you will see... The scanning software is starting up. Isn't that great? Now, this is the Precision Scan LTX, which is the scanning software that ships with uh, all of the HP scanners, actually. Now, what it's done is it's actually done step one for you out automatically by pushing the button. It started a new scan. It brings it in, and it scans the whole surface scanning area of the scanner and allows me to select the area that I want to scan, which is step two, which is marqueeing, just by clicking and dragging the area that I actually want to scan in. And I'm going to choose that area right there. And that now, the third step is where do you want the scan to go? The scanning software only facilitates the scan. It only takes care of actually scanning in the image, but then because we can scan so many different things, we can scan photographs, we could scan line art, we could scan text that we might want to convert into OCR and use it in a word processor, because we have all those different options, it gives us options of where to send it here. ActiveShare is a file management program from Adobe that allows us to manage all of our photographs. 
Next, we choose our output type, which is if we want to change it for text or something like that, we can change it there by clicking and choose a different output type. The size is also, if we want to expand or make an image smaller. And oh, where's resolution? Let me show you where resolution are. That's up in the settings. That's where we go in and set the resolution. Now this particular scanner, as I told you, 600 DPI. So there's 600 DPI if I want to increase the size of my scan. And through interpolated software, I can actually go up to 1200 DPI with this scanner. But I'm just going to leave it at 200 dots per inch because we're going to use this for an invitation. How much resolution should you have and how much information should you put in your scan? Question people always ask. It depends what you're going to use it for. If you're just going to send an email or use it on the web as a picture, use uh, lower resolution, say uh, 75 dots per inch, which is the same resolution as the screen. If you want to archive something and save it for years and years to come, and you might want to print it out in the years to come, then save it at a high resolution because you won't be able to get the information back if the picture is lost or destroyed. Let's just start the scan and get this whole process going. While it's scanning, I should talk about some of the other functions of the scanner itself. We certainly can use it for photos, but I did mention that you can use it for business purposes as well, such as scanning in text. If you get a, a letter that you want to scan in and you want to input the text into an email, well, you just take the, the same process that we've just gone through, except we send it to a word processor instead. Then this software will automatically go through, convert it into text, and allow us to use it for business purposes. Here's the, the photo that we just scanned in. We take a look at it, see if it's what we like. If it is what we like, then we can take it, we can email it to friends, we can use it in any way we choose. Actually, this is a pretty cool scanner. Watch this. You can open the lid up and lift it right off. Now, why would you want to take the lid off? Well, that's so that you can scan in irregular or 3D objects. For example, you can lay a book down, scan in the pages of the book. Or, before we started today, I scanned in one of the digital cameras that we're going to look at later. That's right, I actually scanned in a 3D object like a camera, and it turned out pretty darn good. Isn't that cool? Now, I should make one warning for all the practical jokesters out there. If you sit on your scanner and scan, you void your warranty because it's just not going to withstand the pressure. So none of that 3D scanning, at least not on this show. Yes, sir. So what are my key points in choosing the right scanner? First, get the best optics you can. Real optical resolution is going to give you sharper images. Second, make sure the scanner is easy to use. Ask for a demonstration at your store and make sure that you're comfortable with the scanning controls. Third, make sure that the scanner has good software support. Always visit the manufacturer's website before you buy a scanner and make sure that you can download new drivers and update your scanner easily. Right there, the drivers at the HP site. You'll find a lot of uses in a scanner that go well beyond scanning in a photo and putting it up on the web. The ability to be able to digitize images and documents and then file them and sort them, retrieve them, well, that makes the scanner a powerful business tool as well. Desktop scanning enhances the way that people communicate, the way they collaborate, and the way they stay connected through images. And it's a lot of fun as well, which in my mind makes for a pretty good combination. I want to show you a pretty cool feature all of the HP cameras have in common. It's called JetSend. JetSend is an infrared connection that allows us to beam pictures from one device to another. Actually, beam data from one device to another. In this case, pictures. Take a look at my camera here. If we rotate it to the back side, we see right there a button. That is the JetSend button. If I press that button, the picture that I have displayed on the screen is going to be sent by infrared to whatever device is there to receive it. So we need a device to receive it. How about a printer? If we take a look on the front of this printer, we see an infrared port right here with little JetSend words down beneath. That tells me that I can... Now, that is a JetSend capable device so that I can use it for infrared beaming back and forth between devices. Now, how this actually works is we, first of all, click the print button, and that brings up in this dialog window here instructions to either insert a card, because we can actually take our, our memory card out of our camera, put it in and print, or we point the device at it and tell it to start printing, which is what I'm going to do right now. I turn on the camera. I have a picture selected. I hit the button, and now the beam starts going through and it's trying to connect and you see receiving and it's connecting and sending the information through. Now if you look on this printer you'll notice that the front panel has a lot of buttons on it. That's because because we're infrared printing, we're not using our computer's interface, we don't have access to the printer dialog box within the computer for setting all of the controls, uh, telling it how large to print, how many copies to make, that sort of stuff. So it all has to be done and these buttons here represent all of those functions. Now, one note is infrared is a line of sight network only. So if I put my coffee cup down or I move the camera, or I put my coffee cup down in front of the connection or move my camera, this connection will be lost before all the data has been exchanged and the connection will fail. Look, Ma, 
no wires. One of the maturing areas of high-tech is digital photography. Now, when we first began playing with digital cameras on this show, we immediately saw the convenience, but quality, well, that was still some way off. The first cameras we showed you could only take pictures with relatively low resolution, which meant they were okay for screen images, but inadequate for any printed projects. But the great double whammy of developing technologies has worked its magic on digital cameras. The price has decreased while performance has increased. Some people used to think that digital cameras were quickly going to replace those ancient antiques, the film camera. Well, that hasn't happened, nor is it going to, at least not in the foreseeable future. We're learning that each has its place. Digital has its strengths and weaknesses, as does film. Let's start by showing you three cameras, sort of a good, better, best, from the basic snapping of quick photos to the more advanced cameras that will satisfy even the most serious photo hobbyists. These three cameras represent HP's PhotoSmart lineup. They all have a lot in common with each other. First of all, they're all two-plus megapixel cameras meaning that each will take a picture with over 2 million pixels in it, which is enough to print out a pretty good 8x10 photograph. But you have to look well beyond simple resolution in deciding which camera works for you. Let's start with looking at all of the common features of these digital cameras, which oh, you're going to want to know about. First up, they all use the same standard memory configuration. They all use flash memory, compact flash memory. This is a 16 megabyte compact flash card. Uh, they all use this standard memory now, so you can actually get more memory. You can add, get, I've seen up to, I think, 96 megabytes is the largest that I've seen, but you have available higher resolution. They all also use a common standard interface for connecting to the computer through the universal serial bus. They all share the same set of software for managing it, and they also all share something called JetSend, which if we look on the back of the computer, of the camera, right there, that little arrow, that allows us to send uh, through infrared the images to printers or to other cameras. Now, that's where these three cameras have in common. Where they start to differ is in the quality of optics and what they're used for. This is the basic entry model, the 315. It has, if we look here, a fixed lens. It can actually zoom in and out, but it uses digital technology to zoom in and out. This is a great camera for snapping quick photos, for using, for carrying around, uh, taking pictures of scenery or landscape, using kind of as you would one of the, uh, one of the uh, automatic cameras, one of the automatic 35mm cameras on the market. With the other two cameras, we start to step into a slightly different world where we have a lot more options and a lot more flexibility. But the biggest difference is right here with these cameras. This lens cap tells the whole story. See, the camera is made by Hewlett-Packard, but if we look behind Hewlett-Packard, we see Pentax. This marriage between camera manufacturer Pentax and computer manufacturer HP is the magic behind the success of these cameras. Each one does their own thing and does it very well, and it's the marriage of those two technologies that make these digital cameras work. Now, one of the things we've discovered in using digital cameras over the past few years are the unique things that we can use them for. Things that you would never think of using film cameras for. For example, let us begin a home inventory of our valuables. Let's take a camera and photograph all of our valuables. That way, if we were ever robbed had a fire, a photographic record, that would be very useful in settling our insurance claim. Now, what do I need in a camera to do this task? Well, since we're going to be using lots of close-ups, macro lenses are essential. So, the ability to take a close-up photo. If we go over the capabilities of our three candidates here, we realize that the only ones that we can use are the two top-end ones. See, these both have movable lenses which we can use to be able to take close-up photos. This one, a fixed lens, won't do the job. Good camera, but not going to do the job in this particular case. Now, of these two, they both do a great job. I mean, this 912 just looks like a camera, doesn't it? Arr, 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 it looks like a real good camera. It'll do a great job. We'll look at it in a minute. But we're just going to start things off with the 618. This is actually the camera that I carry around day to day, and I use it an awful lot. Now, let's begin assembling our uh, valuables. And the most important valuable in my particular house, of course, is my fly fishing gear. Now, I'm going to take a nice close-up photo of my rod and reel here, because, boy, if I ever lost that, I would be devastated. Let's look at the camera controls. The 618 is really quite simple. It's really the epitome of point and shoot. There's not a lot of controls to make it complicated, but it does a very good job. At the top here, we have our basic mode controls. We have the little green button set there that allows us to take photos. That's camera mode. Then we have preview mode where we look at the photos. Another mode that manages us to manage the photos kind of in a photo album. And finally, the PC mode, which allows the camera to connect to the computer. Next to those controls are our basic exterior controls. 
for turning on and off the flash, for setting the timer, and finally this one here which allows us to go from close-up mode to distance mode, and we will set it to close-up mode as soon as we turn it on. Actually, I'll turn the power on. Actually, watch the front of the camera. The lens pops out, because we do have a three times optical zoom lens on this camera. I now click to set it to close-up mode, and I'm actually ready to take a picture. If we look at the back, we see the screen, the LCD screen, which allows us to preview the pictures that we've taken and that sort of stuff, and we control all of the different menus through this thumb wheel here. But when I'm taking pictures, I like to disable the display because that saves me a lot on battery time, and then I just use the viewfinder to take pictures like you would with a traditional camera. So let's take a picture, a nice little close-up here. Smile! Now, we take a look, we see we have a photo of it, and now we're ready to connect it to our computer. Now, watch this. See, the software integration between your computer and your camera is very important, and HP has done a wonderful job of making it easy for us. I, first of all, plug my USB cable into my, if I can figure out the proper direction, plug my USB cable into my camera, and now I'm going to take and turn the dial here over to PC. Now watch, when I turn that control to the PC, now something magic happens. The camera sends a message to my computer that something's happening. It wants to talk to it. The PC automatically launches the software that will allow me to download the pictures. Isn't that sweet? So I click Next. It'll show me a list of all of the pictures that I have in this camera. I select the picture that I just took and say I want to download that. I click next, it asks me where I want to download it to, and I'm going to put it in My Pictures Fishing. I finish up, and it downloads that one picture. Isn't that great? Now this will now give us a look at some very important software, which are image management software. I'm going to close the download window, and instead I'm going to open HP's Photo, Im Photo Smart software. This contains a suite. Now if we wanted to manually download the camera, we would do it here. We can also go in and view the images. Now this image management software that we see here is different from photo retouching software. This allows us to categorize and file and find our pictures. The software that ships with the HP cameras is called ACDC. Actually, it's a Canadian product that was developed in Victoria. I really like it. It does a good job. Let's go and look at the pictures that we just took. I double click here on fishing because I put it in my fishing folder. And here is the photo we just downloaded. To view it in full size, I double click on it and take a look at the quality that this camera just took. This is only at 54% size right now. Look at the detail as we zoom in of the lens. Now that is 100%. And look, you can even see the little scratches in the wear marks on my well-used, well-loved reel. This software, having image management software like this, is a real blessing. It, as you, the convenience of digital photography means you're going to take an awful lot of pictures over the years, and the ability to categorize and manage them all is, is a very nice feature with the HP cameras. And in time, actually, all of your digital images will probably be better organized <laughs> than your regular photo album is. Okay, enough with the 618. Let's take a look at the difference in some of the additional features of its big brother, the 912. Now this is a really nice camera. Not that the other one isn't, but this one just does so much more. If we take a look at the top controls on this one, we see that it's got the automatic controls of the, of the 618, but it also has a whole different set of features right here that we can access. What this, these features do is they allow us to set this camera in manual mode. So if you're a real photo hobbyist and you understand things like f-stops and shutter speed and all that, you can set, if you take a look here, you can set all of those different functions yourself so you can manually set up this camera to take photographs. Of course, it still does a very good job in the automatic mode, which is what I would use it for. Now all of the camera controls are here in the top. If we turn the, the camera upside down, kind of, we see all of the basic other controls that we recognize from the 618 here, where we actually turn it to camera mode, where we connect it to the PC, that sort of stuff, and the LCD screen, of course, is here on the back. A few other things with this camera is, it's got a hot shoe so you can add a higher quality flash. If you don't want to use that, the, the high quality flash, you want to use a built-in one, hit the button, it pops up, it's got its own flash built in. Isn't that nice? Okay, let's take a quick picture with this one. I'll set it over to macro. Smile, Mr. Nice Fly Reel. There we go. Took a picture. Now, sometimes you might not want to download your images through the USB cable. You might want a more flexible option. Let me show you something quite cool. I'm going to pop out the flash card, flash memory. There, I got it right there. And if I happen to have a laptop around, I can take that memory, 
slide it into one of these adapters. Now these adapters allow us to slide the whole memory pa package then into a laptop computer with a PCM CIA slot and we can just mount this thing as if it's a logical device and you can just drag and drop your pictures over. There's actually one other way while I'm thinking of that style of downloading images to your camera to your computer, excuse me, that we can do. Here it is. Let me plug in the USB cable one more time. Turn it over to PC so that the camera communicates with the computer. But this time when the software launches, I'm not going to use the automatic downloading software. I'm going to bypass it and say, thank you very much. Don't need your assistance this time. Instead, I'm going to go over and open my computer. And look here. The camera is seen as a device in my computer. So I can double click on it and take a look at all the photos within the computer and manage them just like it's a hard drive from within the operating system. Isn't that neat? If you haven't used a digital camera yet, I hope we've opened your eyes to some of their inner workings. Now, if you're thinking about getting one but are blown away by the number of options out there, let me try and outline the key points that I'd look for. First and foremost, excellent optics make for good cameras. Get one with a good lens. Next, ease of use. Make sure it's a menuing system that you can understand. If you can't figure out how to use a camera, it doesn't do you much good. Next, good integration with your PC. A consistent connection that's easy to download the pictures. If it's a crapshoot, if that connection is a crapshoot, then you lose the convenience factor of the digital camera. And finally, look for excellent library and management software, such as the ACDC software that ships with the HP cameras. When we first showed you digital cameras, we were excited just to be able to take a picture and load it onto our computer. Frankly, we had no idea what to do with that digital picture once we took it. The most profound difference in film and digital is everyday communications. That ability to be able to add a photo to a document or email to better illustrate a point. It really enhances the way that we communicate. Pictures in the digital age are more than memories. They're part of the language. They are part of the culture. They tell stories. They clarify issues in unique and increasingly accessible ways. So smile. What is a flash card? It's an um, application to run a flash program. Uh, it's a memory card uh, for cameras or something. Oh, it has. I think it might have something to do with flash animation, but don't quote me. Uh, it's memory storage. Something for teaching little kids how to spell and pick out shapes. <laughs> Check out our website at dottotv.com. The ever-expanding world of digital imaging, from the personal to professional to the practical. Well, that's all the time we have today. I had a really good time putting these cameras through their paces. I hope we gave you a few ideas about how they might work for you. Thanks for tuning in. For more information, drop by our website. We'll see you next time right here on Dotto's Data Cafe.